We're about to dig in a little further into the industrial era with the help of one of my favorite sources by E.H. Gombrich, A Little History of the World. Before we do that, if you are one of those people who likes to know exactly where you need to focus your attention, go ahead and pause here and have a look at the kinds of information you should be listening for throughout the source. So, chapter 36, Men and Machines, the Industrial Age. After the French Revolution and the final defeat of Napoleon, the rulers of Europe were able to bring about a return to life as it had been before the French Revolution, at least in its outward forms. Once again, there was all the splendor and ceremony of the courts where the nobility paraded, their breasts covered in medals and decorations and wielded much influence. Citizens were excluded from politics, which suited many of them very well. They occupied themselves with their families, with books, and above all with music. For in the last hundred years, music, heard mostly as an accompaniment to dancing, songs and hymns in earlier times, had become an art which, of all the arts, spoke most to people. And here Gombrich is talking mainly about Europe, European culture, which reverted back to um, monarchy after the French Revolution. However, this period of tranquility and leisure was only the visible side of things. There was one enlightenment idea that the rulers of Europe could not suppress, not that they ever thought of doing so. This was the idea Galileo had of a rational, mathematical approach to the study of nature, which had appealed so much to the people at the time of the enlightenment. And so it happened that this hidden aspect of the enlightenment led to a far greater revolution and dealt a far more deadly blow to the old forms and institutions than the Parisian Jacobins, the revolutionaries, ever did with their guillotine, which they'd used to chop off the head of their king. Mastering the mathematics of nature enabled the people not only to understand the forces of nature, but to use them. And they were now harnessed and put to work for mankind. The history of all the inventions that followed is not as simple as you might think. In most cases, they began with an idea. This idea led to experiments and trials, after which it was often abandoned, only to be picked up again later, perhaps by somebody else. It was only when a person came along who had the determination and persistence to carry that idea to its conclusion and make it generally useful that that person became known as the inventor. This was the case with all the machines which changed our lives, with the steam-driven machinery, the steamship, the steam engine, and the telegraph, and they all became important in the 19th century, so in the 1800s. The steam engine came first. A learned Frenchman called Pepin had already been carrying out experiments around 1700, but it wasn't until 1769 that a Scottish engineer named James Watt was able to patent a proper steam engine. At first, the engine was mainly used to pump water out of mines, but people soon saw the possibility of using it to drive carriages or ships. Experiments with steamships went on in England in 1802, and in 1803, an American engineer called Robert Fulton launched a steamboat on the River Seine in France. Commenting on the event, Napoleon wrote, this project is capable of changing the face of the world. Four years later, in 1807, the first steamship made its way up the Hudson River from New York to Albany, its huge paddle wheel churning with much puffing, clanking, and belching of smoke. At about the same time, attempts were also being made in England to propel vehicles using steam, but it took until 1803 for a usable engine to be invented, one which ran on cast iron railway lines. In 1814, George Stevenson built the first effective steam locomotive and named it Blucher after the great Prussian general and in 1825, the first railway line was opened between the towns of Stockton and Darlington. Within 30 years, there were railway lines all over Britain, America, throughout most all of Europe, and even India. These lines went over mountains, through tunnels, over great rivers, and carried people at least 10 times as quickly as the fastest stagecoach. It was much the same with the invention of the electric telegraph, the only means of rapid communication before the telephone. First thought of in 1753, there were many attempts from the 1770s onwards, but only in 1837 did an American artist 
named Samuel Morse, succeed in sending a short telegraph to his friends. Once again, hardly more than 10 years had passed before the use of the telegraph was widespread. However, other machines changed the world even more profoundly. These were the machines which made use of the forces of nature instead of manpower. Take spinning and weaving, for example, work that had always been done by artisans. When the demand for cloth increased around the time of Louis XIV during the age of absolutism, factories already existed, but the work was done by hand. It took a while for people to realize that their new knowledge of nature could be applied to the production of cloth. The dates are much the same as those of the other great inventions. People were experimenting with various sorts of spinning machines from 1740 onwards. The mechanical loom was introduced at about the same time. And again, it was in England that these machines were first made and used. Machines and factories needed coal and iron, so countries which had their own coal and iron were at a great advantage, and England had plenty. All of these developments produced a tremendous upheaval in people's lives, so a big disruption. Everything was turned upside down and hardly anything stayed where it had been. Think for a moment how secure and orderly everything had been in the guilds of medieval cities. Those guilds had lasted right up to the time of the French Revolution and longer. True, it was no longer as easy for a journeyman to become a master as it had been in the Middle Ages, but it was still possible and the hope was still there. A guild was an association of artisans or merchants who would oversee their craft in a particular area. And so what he's saying is before the Industrial Revolution, it was possible to become an apprentice in one of these little collective groups, learn a skill and make a better life for yourself. So social mobility could have existed. Now, all of a sudden, everything changed. Some people owned machines. It didn't take much training to learn how to operate them, just a couple of hours, and then they ran themselves. This meant that anyone who owned a mechanical loom could, with the help of one of two assistants, perhaps his wife, perhaps his children, do more work than a hundred trained weavers. So in other words, after the Industrial Revolution with the rise of these machines, it didn't take much skill to work the machines, so workers didn't gain any valuable skills, and they became incredibly easy to replace. So a big disruption in people's lives. So whatever became of all the weavers in a town into which a mechanical loom was introduced? The answer is that they woke up one day to discover that they weren't needed anymore. Everything it had taken them years to learn, first as apprentices, then as journeymen, was useless. Machines were faster, better, and very much cheaper. Machines don't sleep and they don't eat, nor do they take holidays. Thanks to the new machines, the money that had allowed a hundred weavers to live safely and comfortably could now be saved by the factory owner or spent on himself. Of course, he still needs workers to manage the machines, but only unskilled workers and not many of them. But the worst thing was this. The city's hundred weavers were now out of work and would starve because one machine was doing their work for them. And naturally, rather than see his family starve, a person will do anything, even work for a pittance as long as it means he has a job to keep body and soul together. So the factory owner, with his machines, could summon the hundred starving weavers and say, I need five people to run my factory and look after my machines. What will you charge for that? One of them might say, I want so much if I'm to live as comfortably as I did before. The next would say, I just need enough for a loaf of bread and a kilo of potatoes a day. And the third, seeing his chance of survival about to disappear, would say, I'll see if I can manage on half a loaf. Four others then said, so will we. Right, said the factory owner, I'll take you five. How many hours can you work in a day? 10 hours, said the first. 12, said the second, seeing the job slipping from his grasp. I can do 16, said the third for his life depended on it. Fine, said the factory owner, I'll take you. But who'll look after my machine while you're asleep? My machine doesn't sleep. I'll get my little brother to do it. He's eight years old, replied the luckless weaver. What shall I give him, said the factory owner? A few pennies will do, to buy him a bit of bread and butter. <laughs>
and even the factory owner might reply then, he can have the bread, but we'll see about that better. And this is how business was done. The remaining 95 weavers were left to starve or find another factory owner prepared to take them on. Now, you mustn't think that all factory owners were as vile as the one that I have just described, but the worst of them, who paid the least and sold at the lowest prices, could be the most successful. Then others, against their conscience and their natural instincts, often found themselves treating their workers in the same way. People began to despair. Why bother to learn a skill and take pains to make beautiful things by hand? Machines could do the same job a hundred times more quickly, and often more neatly, and at a hundredth of the price. And so weavers, blacksmiths, spinners, and cabinet makers sank ever more deeply into misery and destitution or poverty, running from factory to factory in the hope of earning a few pennies. Many of them ra raged against the machines that had robbed them of their happiness. They broke into factories and wrecked the looms. But it made no difference. In England in 1812, the death penalty was introduced for anyone found guilty of destroying a machine. And then newer and better machines followed that could do the work, not of 100, but of 500 workers. And the general misery increased. Some people felt that things simply could not go on like this. It was simply not right that a person, just because he happened to own or perhaps inherit a machine, should be able to treat everyone else more harshly than many noblemen used to even treat their peasants. It seemed to them that factories and machines and those sorts of things, which gave their owners such monstrous power over other people's lives, shouldn't belong to individuals, but to the community as a whole. This idea is called socialism. People have many ways about how to organize work in a socialized way, so as to put an end to the misery of starving workers and came to the conclusion that instead of receiving a wage or a salary set by the individual factory owner, workers should have a share of overall profits. Among the many socialists in France and Britain in the 1830s, there was one who became particularly famous. He was a scholar from Germany and his name was Karl Marx. The ideas he had were rather different. In his view, it was pointless wondering how things might be if only the machines belonged to the workers. If they wanted the machines, the workers would have to fight for them, for the factory owners would never give up their factories voluntarily. And it was equally pointless for groups of workers to go around destroying mechanical looms now that they had been invented. What they should do was stick together. If each of those hundred weavers had not gone out looking for work himself, and instead they had all got together and said with one voice, we won't work for more than 10 hours in the factory and we each want two loaves of bread and two kilos of potatoes. The factory owner would have had to give in. True, that in itself might not have been enough since the factory owner no longer needed skilled weavers for his mechanical looms and could take his pick from men so destitute, so poor that they would accept the lowest wages. But this, said Marx, was precisely why unity was so vital. For in the end, the factory owner would be unable to find anyone who would do the job for less if the workers stuck together. So the workers must support each other and not just those from one district or even one country. All the workers of the world must unite. Then they would not only have the power to say how much they should be paid, but they would end up by taking over the factories and the machines themselves, and in doing so, create a world that was no longer divided into the haves and have nots, to the rich and the destitute. For, as Marx went on to explain, the truth of the matter was that weavers, shoemakers, and blacksmiths didn't really exist anymore. A worker who did nothing but pull a lever on a machine 2,000 times a day hardly needed to know what the machine produced. His only interest was in his weekly pay packet and in earning enough to prevent him from starving like his unhappy fellows who had no work. Nor did the owner need to learn the trade which gave him a living, for the work was all done by machines. Which meant, in fact, said Marx, that there were no longer any real occupations there were just two sorts of classes, two sorts of people, 
those who owned and those who didn't, or as he chose to call them, the capitalists, the owners, and the proletarians, the workers, for he liked using words for other languages. These two classes, these two sorts of people, the capitalists, the owners, and the proletariat, the workers, were in a constant state of war with one another. For owners, the capitalists, always want to produce as much as possible for the smallest amount of money, and therefore pay the workers, the proletarians, as little as they can get away with. Whereas the workers seek to force the capitalists, the owners of the machines, to part with as much of the profit as they can be made to. This battle between the two classes of people, so Marx thought, could only end one way. The many dispossessed, the poor, would one day seize the property of the owning minority, not in order to own it themselves, but to get rid of ownership altogether. Then classes would cease to exist. This was the goal of Karl Marx, one that he thought was quite near and quite simple to achieve. However, when Marx published his great appeal to the workers called the Communist Manifesto in 1848, the situation was very different from what he expected. And things have gone on being different right up until today. In those days, few factory owners had any real power. Most of it was still in the hands of those much decorated noblemen whose authority the Congress of Vienna, which had restored European monarchy and the balance of power after the French Revolution, had helped to restore. And it was these noblemen who were the real adversaries of rich citizens and factory owners, the real opponents then. They wanted a secure, orderly, and regulated state in which each had his appointed place as people had always had in the past. This meant that in Austria, for example, Peasants were still tied to inherited estates and were hardly less bound to the landowners than the serfs of the Middle Ages. Artisans were still governed by many strict and ancient regulations dating back to the time of the guilds, and to some extent, were the new, so were the new factories. Here he's talking about political power. So he's saying that despite all of these economic changes, the differences in who had money, political power still stayed where it had in the past with aristocrats, people who came from families that were entitled, that had noble titles, got their wealth usually from owning land. However, citizens who had become wealthy as a result of the new machines and factories, so the capitalists, the upper middle class, were no longer willing to take orders, either from the nobility or from the state. They wanted to act as they saw fit and were convinced that this would be best for everyone. All that was needed was for able people to be given a free reign, unimpeded by conventions, rules, or regulations. And in time, the whole world would be a better place, or so they thought. This is what they, the capitalists, thought. The world looks after itself as long as it isn't interfered with, or at least that's what they argued. Right, pause here and make sure that you have listened for responses to each of these questions. <laughs> 